Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our bi-weekly Bible study. Welcome to all of you who are here in Cincinnati. Welcome to everyone visiting with us on the web, and we'll also view the archives later on. Good to have you with us. Uh, thanks for coming. We're continuing our series on the churches of Revelation tonight, and so we're digging into the next church in line, which is Thyatira. So we'll be talking about Thyatira tonight and its significance for us. So thanks for being with us. Let's ask God's blessing on our Bible study as we begin. So if you bow your heads. Loving Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thank you so much for your wonderful ways. We love your truth. We pray that you'd inspire us and guide us and direct us by your word, that we may learn to apply the things that you've written for us today. So we thank you for these things. We pray for your guidance. We pray for your direction. We pray for your inspiration. So Father, we put it all into your hands and ask this by the authority of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Thyatira is an interesting section in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 2 is where we're going to pick it up tonight. Thyatira, this section in, in Revelation, is the longest section of Scripture of any of the letters to the seven churches. But it's a little bit of a paradox because Thyatira is the least known of the cities. We know less about Thyatira than any of the other cities because it was just an insignificant kind of a place. Wouldn't you love to be from a place like that? Well, it doesn't matter where you're from. It's pretty insignificant. But that's Thyatira. Thyatira was located on a Roman road. You can kind of see it here on the map. To the north was Pergamum and to the south, Sardis, and then heading on to Philadelphia and Laodicea. Thyatira was a very interesting place because it was a place where the members uh, were said to be very good at certain things. Uh, we find in Revelation there are many compliments that are played, paid to the membership in Thyatira. And yet at the same time, they had a difficult issue that was threatening the health of the church. Uh, that issue, in fact, was such a concern that it endangered their relationships. It was such a difficulty that it was one of the most dangerous of all doctrines that ultimately jeopardized their eternal life. And as we think about Thyatira today and the letter that's found in Revelation, we can see that that same issue threatens us today as well. So if you want to turn over to Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, we're going to go through just a little bit of background before we get into the letter itself. Of course, Thyatira, it's kind of in the middle of Asia. That's this area that we're looking at on the map. One of the reasons that it was uh, mentioned here, for one thing, is it's located right along that highway, which was a major highway of commerce. In fact, that's what Thyatira was known for, commerce. If it hadn't been on this road, probably wouldn't even be written about here in the Bible. It wasn't much of a place. As I said, it was kind of insignificant. Uh, it starts out as a military outpost. Seems like it was mainly started to kind of protect Pergamum. That seems to be the reason for its existence initially. Uh, and as you consider... Uh, why it was such a kind of an insignificant place. It was even an insignificant kind of a location. It's actually on a flat plain. You can't tell by looking at this map necessarily, but it was on a flat plain. And because it was on this flat plain, it's an open valley type situation, no protection, no fortifications. It's not high up on a hill, anything like that. And so not very strategic. You know, this is not the place you choose, you know, to, to set up, you know, a military embattlement, but it was just a little, little outpost. Now, one of the things that was interesting, that during this Roman period, which is kind of these biblical times we're talking about, there was peace. And because of that peace, all of those military disadvantages became commercial advantages. It was advantageous to be on a plane because then people could come through the city that much easier uh, because it wasn't a difficult place to get to. 
it could become a commercial center. And, and that's basically what happened to Thyatira. It became a commercial center because people had to travel through it to get to these bigger, more important places. And so beginning uh, in the first records of history as a military outpost, uh, if you were to try to research Thyatira, you'll find most often it's mentioned in history as a city that was conquered. How would you like that to be your claim to fame? <laughs> the fact that somebody else overran you and took over. That continues to happen to Thyatira over its history. And so by the time we get to this period, uh, the Romans have overtaken Thyatira. They're using it uh, as kind of protection for Pergamum. And under this Roman peace, the Pax Romana, that is when Thyatira really began to flourish. It really became that center for commerce. And as people would travel through, uh, they became known for the many different items that they produced as well as kind of imported and exported, I guess you could say. They were famous for what you would call trade guilds. Do you know what a trade guild is? Uh, I suppose if you were to compare it to anything today, it might be like a, a little bit like a union where there's workers of the same trade that come together for advantages. Uh, and so they had guilds of all kinds of sorts of different things in Thyatira. Uh, they've uncovered some of the uh, ruins from Thyatira where there's inscriptions that list some of these trade guilds. So there were leather workers in Thyatira. There were linen workers, there were tanners, there were leather workers, there were potters, there were bakers, all of groups of people that came together for the benefit of their trade. So today we might have carpenters and plumbers and, and masons and things like that. They had their own trades, their own guilds that came together for their own advantages. In fact, the guild that became most important in Thyatira is one that we find one mention of it in Scripture. In fact, if you look in Scripture, there's really only two places where Thyatira is mentioned. One of them is right here. Another one is in the book of Acts. And it references that guild that became probably the most important one in Thyatira. And that is dyeing. Not, not the death kind of dyeing, but dyeing cloth. Dyeing cloth. They became very famous for dyeing a particular color of cloth. And I heard it mentioned right here. It was purple. That's right. Oh, you said purple. Yes. Purple. Purple was the color. And Thyatira became known for its purple dye and dyeing cloths that particular color. Because it was, a, it was quite an intricate uh, system of dyeing cloth back in the New Testament. They say that there were two ways that they could have made this purple dye. Most think it was uh, this first method where they had to take uh, mollusks or some say slugs from the Mediterranean and they would take this uh, slime that they produced and it would produce this purple dye. Now that had to be quite a process in order to do that. Uh, there was a fellow a number of years ago from Germany, a chemist that tried to replicate uh, what they thought to be this purple dye. And so I think it was about 2008 or so he was trying to do this. And he gathered up all these mollusks from the Mediterranean area. And of course, that's just south of here, I guess you could say. And as he tried to do this, you know how many it took in order to produce any usable amount? He had to get 12,000 of these mollusk-like slugs in order just to get enough dye to dye something the size of a handkerchief. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And so they think that, well, maybe that's where they produced this. And so no wonder it became you know, very expensive. If you've got to collect all those you know, slimy little things, that would not be a whole lot of fun, and it would cost a lot uh, in order to do that. Uh, now, other people postulate, well, maybe they were able to produce that purple dye from some type of a plant root. If you look that up and try to find information on it, it's really hard to find anything 
on the, that process of producing plants. Now, some of the plants in that area possibly would have done that as could have extracted you know, that dye from the roots, but it seems most often that this Tyranian purple, which is what that became known as, Tyranian purple dye, was probably produced from these mollusks, which sounds kind of disgusting, but it was, it ended up turning out very beautiful cloth. And so that's kind of a little bit of a background uh, to Thyatira. There was not much, right now there's a, a city that covers this particular area. Uh, they haven't really done that much, much excavating there. Uh, there's not much to see if you were to go to this, you know, the, the ruins of ancient Thyatira. Uh, nobody even started digging around there till like 1968. So there's not much there. And uh, the city that now covers that area is Akhisar, is the name of the, the city that's in this area right now. In fact, if I were to show you pictures, you could look at some of the ruins, and right over the top of some of the ruins, you can see all the buildings uh, from the modern city that's there. Now, another aspect of Thyatira that kind of points to this idea that it wasn't all that much of an important place is that it, it also wasn't a religious center. You know, it didn't have the, the, one of the seven wonders of the world, like Ephesus would have had the great temple there. They didn't have anything like that. It, as far as, as worship, it wasn't a religious center. In fact, they had a kind of a minor god that they worshipped. Uh, like, like most cities of the day, they had their, their patron god. They had their favorite god, kind of of local interest, you know, their, their local hero. They had a god that they worshipped, and uh, his name was Tiramos. Tiramos. And we know this because of ancient coins that are described where this Tiramos was riding a horse. And he also carried an axe, a great big double-edged axe uh, he was in, uh, pictured at on these coins. And so he was the guy. He was their great god with this double-edged battle axe. And uh, this Tiramos, or sometimes Tir Tiramas, would be depicted that very way. And in fact, it seems that over the years, uh, and you might not think this is very important, but it is important, so hang on, listen to this. Uh, it might not seem important, but this worship of Tiramus kind of morphed into worshiping Apollos. Apollos, one of the, the pagan gods as well, the god of light, uh, Apollos, son of Zeus, uh, also comes into play. And so it all kind of morphed in together as the years went on. And so that will be something we'll come back to in a little bit. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, the other aspect of this religious worship that would have been found in Thyatira was connected to the trade guilds. Because these people grouped together, whether they were sellers of purple, whether they were leather workers, whether they were tanners, uh, however they were associated by their crafts, uh, they were organized for their protection, for their benefit, for, for mutual financial benefits as well. Um, and you might think, well, is there any biblical references to this type of thing, to trade guilds? And the answer is yes, yes. You know, in Jerusalem in ancient times, there was a Baker Street? Yeah, and it wasn't just that, oh, we picked that name. No, it was the street of the bakers. So if you go to Jeremiah 37, you can read about the king telling somebody, go down to Baker Street, and guess what they're going to get at Baker Street? <laughs> you get some bread. You can go down there and find that. And so it's also interesting that in Thyatira, there were special worship practices by the guilds. These trade guilds would worship their own you know, God that was maybe their particular uh, patron God of leatherworking or patron God of dyeing cloth. or their pat And so they would worship and they would honor their favorite God that would help them in their trade. In fact, it seems that that might be part of the reference uh, over in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 uh, we're not going to turn there, but I'm just going to try to refresh your memory, and you can look it up later because we may run out of time otherwise. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it talks about meat that's offered to idols in an idol's temple. 
And that idol's temple may have been connected with the trade guilds because the trade guilds would have had their own places where they worshipped, which probably became known as temples. And so they had their own gods, their own pagan feasts, their festivals, their celebrations, their own rituals. Uh, we find a good example of this same concept uh, in the book of Acts. There was a silversmith that sold little idols. And when the Apostle Paul came along and uh, got in the way, a man named Demetrius did everything he could to, to get all the resources of his guild, the silversmiths, together to fight the Apostle Paul and kick him out of town. And so that seems to be another reference in Scripture to the power of these particular guilds. Now, we'll come back to that in just a little bit, but keep that in the back of your mind as well. So keep Apollos and the Tiramos, the pagan god, in the back of your mind, these trade guilds, and this whole concept of mutual benefit for this association. Uh, there's also one other weird little thing that has to do with religion in Thyatira. Uh, they also had uh, someone that was called a Sibyl that was there. A Sibyl would have been a prophetess, uh, a person who would make predictions, uh, try to talk about the future, try to give your, like we might say today, give you your horoscope, different things like there. There was a shrine that was outside the city that was uh, called uh, Sambate, or Sa it looks like Sam Bath, S-A-M-T-H-A-T-H. -A -A uh, but this particular shrine was where people would go and seek this oracle. You know, if you've seen the, uh, what's the movie with all the fighting and all that sort of thing? Um, well, I can't think of the name of the movie where they look for the oracle. Well, this oracle, this Sybil, would be the one. Yeah, you know what it is, but you're not telling me what it is, all right? What's the, what's the name of the movie with the guy fighting and, what is it? The Matrix. The Matrix. Yeah, that's it, The Matrix. Okay. Well, he was seeking the, a Sybil. He was seeking, right, the oracle. The oracle. Well, where does that stem from? That stems from paganism. That goes all the way back. And so here in Thyatira, there was an oracle, someone that you would go and seek your fortune, a fortune teller, a soothsayer. You could call her a witch as well. Uh, so this seems to be tied into uh, the Oriental Eastern aspects of things. I mean, some people say, well, maybe it was a, a, a person of Jewish background, uh, but that doesn't seem a, as likely. And we'll come back to that idea in a minute as well. So many people would go in Thyatira in this area to go consult the oracle, uh, which may have also been connected to these trade guilds as well. And so with that... That kind of sets the background to the city of Thyatira, the city of Thyatira and the people that live there. Now, I'd mentioned there's two places in Scripture that reference Thyatira, one of them here in Revelation chapter 2. The other one is in Acts 16. So if you'll turn with me over to Acts chapter 16, I want to read this quickly because it is significant as it ties in to the Thyatira that's mentioned in Revelation. So go to Acts chapter 16, and we'll begin in verse 14. Acts chapter 16, verse 14. Here is where Paul, on, on one of his journeys, crosses over into Europe and comes to Philippi. And so here he is in Philippi, the foremost city of Macedonia. Uh, and in verse 14, it says, A certain woman, Lydia, heard us. So Paul goes into the city on the Sabbath day. Verse 13, it says, They went to the riverside to pray. The women met there. Verse 14, there was a woman named Lydia that was listening to Paul. Well, what about this Lydia? Well, guess what? It says here, She was a seller of purple. And where was she from? She was from the city of Thyatira. So she's a seller of purple from Thyatira. Uh, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. It says, And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Very interesting. Who was Paul's first convert as he gets to Philippi? It's Lydia from Thyatira. 
She was a seller of purple. Now, here's where it gets kind of interesting. What's she doing in Philippi? Shouldn't she be in Thyatira? <laughs> What's she doing there? Well, we don't know for sure. But could it be possible that she is a representative that has traveled to Philippi, perhaps living in Philippi, for the benefit of the guild that sells purple from Thyatira? Could she be here as a representative of the guild while she's living in Philippi? I think it's a, a distinct possibility that that could be the case. Because at this time, Thyatira was probably at its peak as far as prosperity. And of course, you would need emissaries. You would need people. You would, you would need distributors out there so that your goods could be sold. So was she someone like that that was promoting you know, the guild back home? You know, very possible that that could be the case. So it's interesting, that connection then uh, to Revelation. So if we go back to Revelation chapter 2, Maybe we can get a little bit more of an idea about these guilds that perhaps Lydia could have been a representative for. So if you go back to Gen uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, is where we pick up the letter uh, to those in Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Let's dig into this letter, the longest letter to these churches. And as it begins, it begins like the others. It says, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write. So here's a letter that's written. The angel doesn't seem to be just an angel, but probably the pastor, the minister. You know, someone that's leading the congregation seems to be who that's referring to, The because an angel is a messenger, the messenger, the leader, uh, possibly the pastor. And what is the letter saying? Verse 18, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. As this letter begins, something that isn't found anywhere else in the book of Revelation, Christ is referred to as the Son of God. Doesn't seem very important, does it? But this is the only place. This is the only time this phrase is used in the book of Revelation. Why is that significant? Why, why do you think that would be important? Well, there's, there's certainly a lot of symbolism that's going on here as we read through this letter to those in Thyatira. You know, what is Jesus like? Is this the Jesus that walked the earth with the disciples? Is that who's being described here? Eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine breath. That's not, that's not the incarnate Christ, is it? That's the risen Lord, Master, High Priest. That's Jesus Christ in His glorified form. And He is the only one who ever was incarnate, the only God that was ever in the flesh and then crucified and resurrected. And as the risen Christ, here's what He's like. And He describes Him, I think, this, this way for a very distinct purpose. I mean, you go to other sections of Scripture that describe Him much the same. You go to Daniel chapter 10, a description very similar to this is found there as well. But I think it's important, especially as you think about Thyatira. What was their God like? What was their patron saint, if you want to call him that? What was their patron saint like? Well, he was this God riding a horse with a battle axe. But wait a second. Is that any comparison to the God, <laughs> to the Savior? You know, this Tyramus that morphed into Apollo that well, eventually in the Roman Empire, kind of merged with emperor worship, you know, worshiping the Caesar, all of that came together. And as Apollos, the son of Zeus, you see, the Bible's telling us that is nothing compared to the God. <laughs> that is nothing compared to the Son of God. That is nothing compared to the Savior that we have. He's not just riding a horse with a battle axe. He is the God with flame of fire in His eyes. He has burnished brass, fine brass as His feet. And so we find this description of an all-powerful Jesus Christ. He's got eyes of flame that are piercing, eyes that will pierce 
right into the very heart of people and circumstances and things. He knows our motives. He can penetrate right through our exterior, right down to the very heart and core of our thoughts. That's the kind of God that we have. He's, what, what, where's that passage uh, about judging the thoughts and the intentions of the heart? I think it's in Hebrews where it talks about that's the kind of God we have. He's able to judge our thoughts. He knows our intentions. And a couple of chapters later here in the book of Revelation, it talks about him on a horse, on a white horse. Uh, well, maybe we should just go over there for just a moment. Um, I think it's in Revelation, mm, Revelation 19, is that where it is? Yeah, Revelation 19, uh, verse 11, describes something that is so much greater, so much more powerful than any local little patron saint. Uh, Revelation 19, 11, I saw heaven opened, behold a white horse, he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of piercing insight that Jesus Christ has, so much more superior than any God of a, a little local insignificant town. And so that's being pointed out very distinctly to those in Thyatira. In fact, it doesn't stop there. It also describes his feet of fine brass. Fine, well, why would that matter? Well, one of the guilds in Thyatira also were those that made bronze. In fact, they were known for making the Roman helmets out of bronze. And so it's not just any little craft that they're talking about. And instead of being on his, the, his head, it's on his feet, which is also kind of an interesting turning everything upside down sort of thing because your feet have to be strong. You have to know where you're going. Uh, this major trade of bronze making is kind of cut right to the core because here's a Savior who is totally permanent, that is totally stable, and this fine brass is glowing and radiating. And in a way, what does that say? Don't mess with Christ. You don't mess with this God because He is God, and He judges, He walks, He carries Himself with perfection and righteousness. And his feet with burnished brass can take him wherever there's a need. And so in a way, this image of the risen Christ is, is kind of scary compared to what they're used to thinking of in terms of their little local patron God. And so no wonder this particular letter starts like this. Is that going to get your attention? That gonna I'm going to recognize the difference between that Risen, risen Christ and this little God who's kind of our little town favorite, yeah, you're going to recognize that. You're going to say, whoa, there's, there's some serious things that are going to be addressed here because this is, this is critical. And of course, it's followed immediately after that if we go back to Revelation 2. Notice where he goes with this initial description as he talks about his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass. He says, I know your works. Uh, similar phrase that he says to every one of the churches, all seven churches, he says the same thing. He can see right through it. Of course he knows it. Of course he knows who we are, what we are, what we do, and he knows everything. So all seven, of course, the implication is it's all-encompassing, all-encompassing. He knows what we do. Of course, he also then says in the rest of verse 19, he knows your love. He knows your service. He knows your faith, your patience. Well, those are, all, those are all good things. Those aren't pagan things, are they? Those are all good things. In fact, it's, it's interesting that these pairs of words kind of fit together. Have you ever noticed that before? That we, we have love and service. We have faith and patience. You see, it, it starts with love because love is what's on the inside. What comes out when you love? Helping others, 
serving, giving, right? Without love, is it genuine giving? Well, now you're doing things for selfish purposes. But he pairs those th two things together, I think, to, to make that point. And the works, you know, the patience is, is uh, kind of stemming from faith. Faith is on the inside. The works, the actions then, are on the outside. And so we have those pairs of words here that I think is showing that much more how they are doing some very, very good things. Almost sounds surprising when you, you see this risen Christ pictured at first, and then we start out with almost, I think, some of the best compliments to any of the churches when he says, I, I know your works, your love, service, faith, your patience. And then he says, not only that, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. Literally meaning, you're even doing better now than you were before. That's not like some of the others. Remember some of the other letters said, oh boy, get back your first love. You've lost it. Well, this is not true in this sense in Thyatira. Not at all. He says what you're doing now is that much better. You've actually improved. And so when you see what what they're doing, boy, we look at it like this and you say, wow, this is a flourishing church. This is a strong congregation. Imagine walking into that congregation. What would that be like? Because we're talking about the church of God. We're talking about the church of God in Thyatira. We're talking about God's people. We're not talking about some pagan congregation, but this is God's church. And so if you were to go into this congregation what would it be like? Okay, you're a stranger. You're from the 21st century. You appear in Thyatira. What would they think? Wow, you dress weird. Oh, no, they wouldn't think that. But what would you think? Well, you'd probably be impressed. You'd probably be impressed. They're probably friendly. They're probably hospitable. You're probably impressed with the things that they're doing, the energy that might be in that congregation. It would probably be pretty impressive. And... Uh, point to the fact they, they must be very dedicated people. Yet, when you really get down to what's going on in Thyatira, something's myth, missing, right? There's something amiss in Thyatira. And that's what Christ begins to address next. If you look back to verse 20, look to verse 20, Revelation chapter 2, gets into what's missing. And we're going to read right through this little section, uh, but we're going to tear it apart in just a moment. Verse 20 says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Not only that, verse 23, I will kill her children with death and all the churches that I know and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works." Wow, that sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? That sounds pretty harsh. But did you notice where this whole problem stems? From where does this problem stem? Well, back in verse 20, makes it very clear. It says, I have a few things against you. Why? Because you allow it. You allow it. They're allowing these things to happen in God's church. And this offsets all of these wonderful traits he just got done mentioning. And you look at this, this critical problem that they have. If you look this up in various translations, it says, you allow it, you tolerate it, you permit it. Some say you are so permissive that you put up with these things. As God's people, they were putting up with what is described next as Jezebel. Jezebel. Now, we 
probably are familiar with the story of Jezebel. If you go back to 1 Kings, the story of the wife of King Ahab, Jezebel, probably one of the most infamous women in the Old Testament, Queen Jezebel. She was idolatrous, right? She was just a vile person, just a disgusting personality. And we, we remember her story from the paganism that she engulfed Israel in. Remember the issues that she had? She had hundreds of priests, prophets to Baal. She had hundreds of prophets to Astarte. And we probably remember the story of Elijah and the prophets of, of Baal and how they had their, their challenge there. Well, that was Jezebel. She was the one that, that promoted paganism right in the very court of the king. And so we're told here in uh, Revelation chapter 2, you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach, seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and eat things sacrificed to idols. So there's the issue. Well, who is this Jezebel? It's pointing back to somebody like Jezebel of the Old Testament, but who would it be in Thyatira? Some people think that it might be this Sibyl, this oracle, this Sibyl to Sambate. Well, would that be the most likely case? Well, she was kind of a prophetess, you know, in that way. Uh, would someone like that have the power to infiltrate the church to a level of, of this type of seduction? It's possible, but it doesn't seem like a soothsayer, a witch, a, a, a false prophetess like she was would have had that much influence. Uh, to me personally, I think that's probably unlikely. Probably unlikely. Interesting connections there, but doesn't seem like that's the case when you look at the overall context of this letter. Now, there's others that uh, speculate that maybe the bad influence that Jezebel was Lydia. Now, that's kind of weird. <laughs> Lydia, in the book of Acts, the first convert, it seems, in Philippi. That's, that's just kind of strange. Uh, there's not really any proof. There's no evidence of that. There's really nothing that you can link, but there's a couple of you know, people out there that speculate, well, maybe that's who it was just because that's the only other time Thyatira was mentioned. But that doesn't seem very likely either. Uh, th there's another theory that perhaps this Jezebel was an important woman in the congregation. You know, there were prophets and prophetesses uh, in the early church, was it possible that this was just a prominent woman within the congregation that had this much negative impact and influenced the whole church? Well, it's possible. It's possible. But is it the most likely explanation of who this Jezebel is? Well, maybe we should ask the question, is she really a person? Is it even a person that we're talking about, or is it symbolic of something else? You're right. It seems like it points to the fact that it's representative of something that isn't even a person. It seems that this Jezebel that's mentioned here is a representation, or it's a, it's a sense that this is a, a representation of the influence that's being propagated on the church. Uh, kind of, you could say, a personification of a teaching. A personification of, well, what was Je Jezebel life like in, in the old days? You know, how would you describe uh, Ahab's wife? How would you describe King or Queen Jezebel? Well, would, you wouldn't be far off if you said she's the personification of evil. Well... This doesn't seem to be any different here. What does this personification of evil do? 
What is she like in Thyatira? Well, she encourages everyone to compromise their beliefs. That certainly ties in with the symbolism of Jezebel from the Old Testament as well. And what this seems to point to is encouraging the participation of the practices of the trade guilds, the pagan worship of the trade guilds. Because if you were to research what these trade guilds did in their practices, there was definitely a religious aspect to what these trade guilds did. There was always at least three parts to their meetings, their, we'd say, worship services, because they had to worship the god of their trade, right? The god of their guild. And so they each had their own private little god, and they would always pour out a little drink offering to them, pour out some wine in honor of their patron god. And so they would do that. They would then have a meal, have a sacrificial meal in honor of their patron god as well. And guess what followed? The wine, the meal, and then what came next? Well, what does this Jezebel lead the people into? She teaches, all right, teaching compromise and allowing certain things and seducing servants to commit sexual immorality. And so the, the meetings of the trade guilds in their worship at the end of the night have a big orgy, you know, sex for everybody. And so illicit sex was part of the worship of their patron god of the guild. Oftentimes these things were held in their own little special meeting halls. Uh, it wasn't the Mason Hall of the day or, you know, anything like that, but it was their hall where they would honor their patron god of their guild. And it always began with a, a formal uh, honoring uh, to their particular saint, we could call it, or their god. They would eat meat that was offered to those gods as well. And so what was going on? Well, I think we'd see everything that's described right here. Teaching seduction, uh, servants committing sexual immorality, eating things, sacrifice to idols. And this was common. This was an everyday kind of occurrence among the trade guilds. And guess what? If you were a tradesman, you worked a craft, you're expected to participate. I mean, this is your group of people. You want to trade? You want to be able to have an income? You want a job? You better be a part of the group. Because if you're not a part of the group, how are you going to make your living? How are you going to take care of your family? How are you going to have a livelihood? You see, so it was pegged to that and that pressure that was put on the church in Thyatira. You want a job? Well, you better do what's necessary. You better do what's expected. You better participate in the guild practices. And so it's interesting because God continues to make this connection to ancient Jezebel and Thyatira because He says here, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. So God is giving them time to repent. They should change. And in fact, it's kind of alluding back to the old Jezebel, to the ancient Jezebel. Was Jezebel of ancient times given time to repent? Absolutely she was. Did God just send down a, a lightning bolt from heaven and Jezebel was gone? Nope. He sent Elijah. Elijah, you go to Jezebel. You go to the king and you tell him what's going to happen. You tell him what's going to happen if they don't change. And so Elijah was sent and he prophesied to them. Did she change? No, in fact, he predicted how she would meet her demise. It had to do with the, the dogs, didn't it? Yeah, and so she had time to repent. And in fact, you can even read a little bit about Ahab that Ahab kind of changed a little bit. He kind of had a, a momentary kind of repentance, I guess you could say. And God kind of put off a little bit of the punishment for a while, right? Gave him, gave him time to repent, but ultimately she didn't. And so here it's, it's interesting that the church is told to repent. And then he makes this interesting connection here. 
Uh, all right, since she didn't repent, verse 22, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And so once again, time is given to change, to repent, to change the way you think, change your actions. Otherwise, you're going to be cast into a sick bed. Kind of interesting. You see, what, what kind of bed were they using before? Well, a bed of sexual immorality. Now, we're looking at a bed of affliction. A bed of affliction. Uh, that also ties back to Jezebel. You think about Jezebel, and especially those that commit adultery with her, uh, this bed of affliction certainly fell upon her family, fell upon ancient Jezebel's family. Uh, her son, her son had an interesting circumstance. Uh, Ahaziah was her son. He was walking on his balcony. And what happened to Ahaziah? He fell through the trellis right down to the ground. And you can read that story in the beginning of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 1 talks about Ahaziah falling. Guess where he ends up? You fall off the, the, the balcony down to the ground, you're going to be broken up. You're going to be hurting. He had to have been in that bed of affliction for a long time. And of course, did he repent? Because he bought into mom's things. He bought into mom's paganism. He didn't, didn't trust the true God. He bought into everything mom was teaching. He let his mother seduce him into false practices. He falls off the balcony, bam, broken up, the bed of affliction. Does he repent? Does he turn to God? Does he change his thinking? Nope. You read 2 Kings, it says he sought Baal or Baalzebub to find out if he was going to survive or not. Instead of turning to the true God, he turns to the Philistine God and seeks wisdom and insight from him. And so all this time, whether it's Ahaziah or Jezebel, it time to repent and change. This was a warning. You better change now. But like Thyatira, as we find here, they did not repent. They, they wouldn't repent. In fact, in this little section of Scripture, this sick bed that's mentioned here, uh, I don't think it only alludes back to Jezebel and the connections with the trade guilds and the sexual immorality, uh, but there's also a, an alternate translation for that particular word of the sick bed or the bed of tribulation. It could also be called the banqueting bed, the banqueting bed, because they didn't really literally have a bed there, they would have had these couches, we'd probably call them today, big, big couches that they would lounge and eat because they wouldn't sit around the table like we do in our dining rooms and, and eat from the dining room table. They would lounge as they were eating. And so their disgusting habits happened that way as well. But whatever you call it, it's obviously a bed of immorality. And that bed then turns into the punishment that is well-deserved. And so here... Uh, it's an interesting contrast, isn't it? Interesting contrast from the lust and degradation of the trade guilds to turning into the pain and the torture and probably their, their greatest torment. That happened to Ahaziah. It happened here in Thyatira, it seems, uh, as well. All right, down to verse 23 then. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. So once again, we have those piercing eyes of Christ seeing straight through, penetrating right down to the heart and very thought. Uh, and kind of a scary thing that the children would also be killed. Why would, why would that be included here? Well, these aren't innocent children. These are children that have bought into the heresy, that have bought into the lies that have bought into the whole perspective of immorality. Just like Jezebel and Ahab. You go back to Jezebel and Ahab, what happened to all of Ahab's sons? They were all killed. They were all killed. They were going to wipe out that evil influence. They didn't want any of that. 
And so that same type of destruction, which would have certainly come to people's minds as they read this letter, that's predicted for these who are heretical, those who are promoting these heresies, those who are allowing these things as well. And so here we, we begin to see that very thing. You may have the outward appearance of patience. You may have the outward appearance of being hospitable. You may have the outward appearance of love and good works. But wait a second. We have a Savior that pierces right through that and knows exactly who you are, and you're not fooling anybody. That's exactly what Christ is saying here. He knows whether their repentance is real or not. He says it very clearly. Verse 24 then, verse 24, it says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And so here we have a remarkable statement. There are some there that are faithful, that are loyal. They haven't fallen into this terrible heresy. Uh, he says it's so bad that they've fallen to the depths of Satan. I mean, what are we supposed to uh, know? What are we supposed to experience? What is, what is God's church supposed to have an understanding of? Well, in 1 Corinthians, it tells us we're to know the deep things of God. But here we have the contrast to that, people who are experiencing the depths of of Satanism, the depths of satanic approach to Christianity. You see, on the spiritual side of things, we know the Spirit searches the deep things of God, all things. That's what 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 10 talks about that very thing. And the issue here is, is there is a major problem, because this isn't just a minor issue. Would it be possible this could undermine the whole of Christianity? You see, that's how dangerous this doctrine is. That's how dangerous this seduction, this, this prophetess of allowance is, this prophetess of tolerance is. You see, that's another way of saying, well, it's the good old Roman approach. You know, just, just bring your God right in here amongst the rest of our gods, and uh, yeah, Christ could be a part of all of this. Make Him another one of our gods. That would be good enough. Wouldn't that be great? Talk about undermining Christianity. In well, fact, <laughs> did that happen? Are there churches today that claim to be Christian but have very little connection to the Christianity of the Bible? You see, you don't have to say that, you know, Caesar is Lord. You know, just, just recognize hey, he's not really that bad, right? We can just add it to the rest of our Roman gods, and, and you know, that, that should be okay. You see, that was part of the issue with these people. They tolerated and allowed these false teachings and wrong actions that made, in a, in a sense, it, it brought an alliance with paganism, didn't it? It kind of brought it all together. So by protecting their trade and their occupation, it really made this whole teaching and their practice that much more insidious. So by the time we get down to verse 25, let's, let's notice here, verse 25. He says, hold fast what you have till I come. It's talking about those who have been doing what's right. Hold fast till I come. He says, he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations. So he will give power. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels. Kind of a reference to Revelation chapter 20 where, where Christ returns. It says, uh, also we can find that in the Psalms as well. He says, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he says, hold fast. Hold fast to righteousness. Hold fast to what is good. And if you hold fast what is true and right and good, what's going to be given to you? No, it's not that you'll just be able to get up early in the morning, see the stars, 
No, he talks about the morning star, the, the star that, that brings light. Well, what is the morning star? He's talking about Christ himself. Uh, you could look over at Revelation 22, specifically spells that out. We will be given Christ. That's, that's the greatest promise of all, you know, to rise to meet Christ in the air when he returns, to be his, you know, to be a member of the God family, greatest, greatest gift of all, certainly to do that. And so we, we see that we'll be able to rule, he says, with a, a rod of iron, with Christ. Literally, that word rule right there means to shepherd. It doesn't mean to beat somebody over the head, but to shepherd as a shepherd would have a staff. Yeah, I can destroy sinners, like it talks about, like potter's vessels, but it can also guide and lead and help and serve as well. And so here, as this letter concludes to the, the church in Thyatira, the advice is, Overcome, persevere, keep doing what's right. So as we think about this particular letter to the church in Thyatira, see any connections to us today? Any lessons we can learn for today? I think so. I think there are many. It is very interesting. Uh, a connection to Thyatira that we have. Any persecution going on in the church today? Very little, if any, right? Very little. Anybody being put to death? Anyone being thrown in jail? You know, I don't hear much anything like that today. Not happening. You know, has there been any laws passed by any governments that says, you know, the church of God is outlawed? And you better not be found keeping the Sabbath. You better not be doing these things with the holy days or you, we're going to force you to, to eat unclean things. Anything like that? Not much. Not much, especially not here in America. Not happening at all. We're like Thyatira. No persecution going on. No difficulties like that. And that's the difficulty. This infection came from within the church. It came from within they allowed these things. They allowed this kind of an attitude. You know, join a trade guild or lose your job. Your job is at risk. Your choice is prosperity, blend in with society, or loyalty to Christ. You think that's going on today? Every day. Every day. I have to keep the Sabbath? Well, I could lose my job. Really? How much are we like Thyatira? You see... This dangerous doctrine is the doctrine of compromise, the, the, the doctrine of allowances. You have to make a choice. And we are faced every single day with pressures to conform, pressures to fit in, pressures to not stick out, pressures to make wrong choices and wrong judgments. We're faced with those things every single day. And yet, as this letter says to Thyatira, we better hold back. You know, how much religion is faced with this? doesn't matter what you believe. America today will tell you it doesn't matter what you believe. Just be a good person. If you're a nice person, that's all that counts. Be nice to people. Be a humanitarian. Because that's really what counts. Baloney. That is pure garbage and it's heresy. You have to be a good person, but you don't do it to blend in. You can't do it to compromise. You can't do it to allow these things. It is unacceptable just to be a good person, and that's enough. Just to accept wrong behavior is unacceptable. To allow that and say, this is, this is a good thing, unacceptable. Are, are, are there lifestyles that are wrong, that are unacceptable or not? God says, yes, there is, and there's no two bits about it. That's all there is. It is unacceptable. There are unacceptable lifestyles that we cannot allow because God doesn't allow it. And to say anything else is being a true Thyatiran. And God says, wow, that's not a place where you want to be. And you know what? They look like real Christians. They looked like really good people. They were really nice people because they had good jobs and they were able to be prosperous. They were able to be charitable. They could give money. They could you know, help charities and fund things that were good things. They seemed to be of fine character. 
But it was all a facade. It was all a facade. It was not true Christianity. They were infidels. They were faithless individuals. That's what an infidel is, a non-believer, an unbeliever. And so when we're faced with these things, we can't just look like a Christian. We have to confront evil. We have to confront it. We have to confront error in our own lives first and foremost because Thyatira teaches us we cannot mix the truth of God with the ways of this world. It is unacceptable. Can't be done. You can't syncretize those things. You can't mix them all together. And so today, we look out in that world today, Jezebelism is alive and well. But we've got to make sure it is dead in the church. We have to make sure it's dead in our lives as well. So no doubt, this letter, maybe just to sum it up, be careful what you tolerate. Be careful what you put up with. Be careful with what you compromise. Does your commitment to the Father and Christ come first or not? That's the letter to Thyatira. So hold fast. Because there are those, as Thyatira says, that are with the truth. Keep overcoming. Keep striving. Keep His works. Overcome till the very end. And God says, there is a reward. There is a blessing. We can be children in the family of God with all of the wonderful blessings that that brings. So let's keep going. Let's keep those works to the very end. And we can be assured that we'll be there at the return of Christ. All right, well, that'll do it for our study for tonight. Uh, in two weeks, we'll continue our series. We're going to be heading to Sardis next. Mr. Gary Petty will be conducting the next Bible study uh, about the church in Sardis. So we hope you'll join us next time. Thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, have a good evening, and we'll see you next time.